Hello, hello. So, our next speaker I'm really excited about. She's a design-focused engineer who works at a company I absolutely love. You might have heard of it before, called 53. They create an app called Paper, which is just incredible. With it, you know, just with touch of your finger, you can create beautiful pieces of art like this one, and this one, and this one. And it's like that effect where you see it on the App Store, and you see all these beautiful pictures, and you say, yes, I want to draw like that. And so you download it, and then this is what happens. <laughs> So, I think that looks like us. Yeah, we got the t-shirts, at least. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> pretty. <laughs> anyway, please give it up for Tara Fiener. Okay, hello. A minute, let me get this in presentation mode. Cool. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm super excited to be here. It's my first time ever in Sweden. And I really like that the way you say hello is hey, except um, when you only know English. So when people were saying hey to me, I was like, oh, hey. And then they would start speaking Swedish to me. So all week, I've been saying hi and hello um, and like really announcing it to be like, hi, like, I, I only speak English. Um, so yeah, my name is Tara. I'm T. Fiener on Twitter. And we're going to talk about creating expressive UIs with React.js. Um, so expressive, what does that mean? Um, I definitely had that question from a lot of folks who asked me what my talk was about. So before we could talk about creating expressive UIs, we need to talk about what expressive means. And I had to have at least one Beyonce GIF in my talk. So this is our, uh, our expressive Beyonce GIF. Um, but let's hop right into it, and let's talk about what expressive means. Um, so expressive, oh, one minute. I seem to have lost my notes. This is a problem we can solve. All right. So I basically went and looked up the definition of expressive and Basically, this is what I got. This is just dictionary.com, so nothing fancy. Not my favorite dictionary. But basically, it says that expressive um, is anything from being full of expression, serving to express, indicative of power. Um, but when you get a little bit deeper and you find the real good definition, this is sort of what you get. It says, to put thought into words, utter or state, to show, manifest, or reveal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as in speaking, writing, or painting, to represent by a symbol, character, figure, or formula. OK, so that sort of helps, but not really at all. So I'm going to tell you what it means, but we're going to start with um, human expression. And basically, human expression is the most basic form of, of expression. Like, we're born, and we smile, and we cry, and we look surprised, and we don't have to say anything. We just know what that means. Another form, ink. So back, way, way, way back, cavemen used ink to tell stories and basically used ink as a method of expressing themselves and, and what was happening at that time. And then moving a little bit more to my favorite form of expression, imagery. So I can basically text any of my friends the two girls dancing emoji, and without saying any words at all, they know exactly what I mean, which is I want to go dancing. And this is even getting like, crazier and crazier. With things like Bitmoji, all of a sudden, I've created this miniature version of myself who's basically doing emoji-like things. So it's like the ultimate form of expression. But moving beyond just images, we also have text as a form of expression. And like, more notably, I think Markdown is like, kind of insane. Like, isn't it amazing? It's, I spend so much of my day in Markdown. And, um, I can basically look at a pound symbol and know that that means header. Or I can look at dash and two square brackets and know that that's a checklist with GitHub flavored markdown. So I think like, text as a form of expression is just like, kind of amazing and becoming cooler and cooler. So I wanted to dig deeper into what expressive meant. So I put a prompt out to the, the 53 paper community. And I just asked the question, what does the word expressive mean to you? And I got a whole bunch of different replies back. So you can basically remix ideas and add something. 
Um, people, you know, drew emojis, they wrote things about emotion. Um, but this one person kind of did this beautiful, like, blue with this orange um, orb that I keep landing on. And they basically said this, and I thought it was a really great definition. So they say, to me, something is expressive when it does not need a long explanation. You just get it somehow, no matter how simple or complex. So that's great. And for me, I kind of took from that, expressive means ease of readability and ease of use and application. So if we're going to talk about expressiveness in React, we have to start with expressiveness in JavaScript and what it means to even be an expressive language. So again, it went down this like deep, dark internet hole that started with Wikipedia and basically found this, which is, in computer science, the expressive power, which is also called expressivity, um, or expressiveness of a language, is actually the breadth of ideas that can be represented and communicated in that language. Pretty cool. OK, we can work with that. And then, you know, digging even deeper, I ended up finding this really, really awesome article by um, Donnie Burkholz on Redmonk, and he basically goes super, super deep into analyzing the expressiveness of language. So he wanted to see if it was possible to rank the programming languages we have today based on their efficiency or expressiveness. So one proxy for that is actually looking at how many lines of code actually change in each commit. So if you could actually look at that, then you could potentially derive how expressive each language allows you to be in the same amount of, of space. And what shook out of that was that ClojureScript, CoffeeScript, and Haskell you know, were the top ones, which makes sense. I mean, CoffeeScript in particular was basically created to be a more expressive form of JavaScript. And even more beautiful, basically ECMAScript 6.7, ES 2015, is, has adapted a bunch of the expressive language features of JavaScript, or of CoffeeScript, sorry. Including my personal favorite, destructuring. I just think destructuring is the greatest, and I basically destructure absolutely everything now. So basically, you can take any object um, that we're used to referencing with dot notation, and you can assign l the left hand to the right hand dot whatever. So Create factory here is a method that React has. So we can basically say take react.createFactory and assign it to create factory. So what this ends up doing is removing all these nested um, object dot notation throughout my entire file and basically allows me to look at the top and see how things are extracted and pulled out. So it makes my code a lot cleaner. You can also do destructuring assignment. So if you really don't like the way that the variable or whatever was named on the, um, on the library you're using, you can basically assign it using colons. So it's prop types in React, but you can assign it to be PT, for example, if, if that's something you're into. I'm actually kind of verbose by nature, so um, I tend to not do that. Um, also, the spread operator, ES 2015, allows an expression to basically be expanded in places where multiple arguments or functions for function calls or mul multiple elements for array literals are expected. So if I have this Drake lyric here, um, basically I can have the ending, and instead of having to do a push or, or write like a couple extra lines of code to, to munge these arrays, now I can just use a spread operator to go dot, 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 ending. And what we'll get is started from the bottom, now I'm here, which is great. And moving on to another one of my favorite um, ES 2015 things, just template strings in general. We get everything from string interpolation to embedded expressions, multi-line strings, um, string formatting. Basically, it ends up removing all of these crazy random helper functions that I had to munge strings all over my code base by just taking advantage of, um, of template strings, which is awesome. So that's expressiveness in the language. So the language is inherently becoming more and more expressive, and we can now use less code to actually get the things we want in JavaScript. But how does that actually relate to React.js? So we're going to break it down um, three ways. We're going to talk about expressiveness by the framework, expressiveness with the tools, and in the server and beyond. 
So let's start with the framework. And before I actually get into the, the expressive features of React.js, we should probably start with what React.js is, for those of you who might not know. So I like to do a React.js in 30 seconds in three GIFs. Um, sometimes it goes more than 30 seconds. I'll try to keep it short. So I don't know if anybody's familiar with Dragon Ball Z, <laughs> but in Dragon Ball Z, they have this crazy move, which is like called, I'm going to say this totally wrong, Kemi Hemi Ha. And they basically take this ball of energy and they like build it up and then they shoot it down at their opponents. I kind of like to think of state in React as being kind of like the Kamehameha, but in an application. So state is held globally at the top, always, and is pushed down to absolutely all branches, leaf nodes, et cetera. So there's only one single source of truth, which is incredibly important. And also makes things like undo and redo fairly easy, because if you're taking snapshots of your global state at all times, you can e easily push it back in at the top of the app and, um, and basically get that functionality. So I think it's the single most important principle in React. The second one, the one that we hear about all the time, the virtual DOM. So it's a snapshot of the current DOM and the next DOM in memory. Basically, they're diffed whenever the state changes and anything dirty is rendered or re-rendered, which is great. But what it does is it takes care of basically updating, adding, and removing nodes for us in the most performant way possible, which is great. Um, I used to write a lot of backbone code, and that was something that you had to do manually, and you're always thinking about when the state changed what the best way to, to optimize your, um, your DOM action was. And then the third thing is the view. So React truly is kind of like the view in MVC. Um, all React components have one main function, which is render. That's the thing that you really, really care about. Um, and things like data and, um, and controllers and et cetera, routers, that's all kind of handled in different ways, and I'm super happy to talk about those um, at the bar afterwards. So when I saw React for the first time, this is like their, their to-do um, example on their website. I'm usually kind of grossed out by to-do examples just because there's so many of them. And I looked at this code, and I wasn't super impressed. Um, it just looked like every other to-do app I've ever seen. So my first instinct was to kind of just be like, mm, no, I don't really want to learn a new thing right now. Um, but as I started digging in, I started to find that React had a bunch of really neat features, which actually kind of made um, developing with this framework a more expressive experience for me. So the first one, prop types. They're essentially the contract that every component has with whatever component um, is rendering it. So they have a bunch of native ones built in for things like string, bool, and array. But you can also um, go a little bit deeper with them. So you can like require thing, you can require a prop type, make them optional. And optional prop types are really great for doing um, any kind of optimistic UI rendering. So if you're waiting for data to come back from the server, but you want to go ahead and render the UI anyways, um, they're just, yeah, they're amazing. So that's kind of how we've been defining all of our uh, component contracts at 53. It's, it's looking at every component in code review really carefully and seeing how much we can make optional to get faster optimistic UI rendering and how much actually is required to render the component. But you don't even have to use React's built-in prop types. You can actually create your own. So they have a pretty flexible way for actually creating custom prop types. And then you can just use those. So you see I have a search result prop type, which has a search term and then a bunch of items. And then in the, the search component, I can say that results need to abide by the search results prop type contract. And we actually, for every single type of response we get from our API, we actually have a, a custom prop type that we're using. Um, on top of that, it has a super clear component lifecycle. Um, it doesn't just have a super clear component lifecycle, but it warns you and basically like freaks out at you if you like do anything against its component lifecycle in the developer tools. So it makes it really easy to make sure that you're actually using React the way you're supposed to use React. So that starts with you know getting whatever default properties, getting the state. We try to minimize using state and React as much as possible, um, just because I find that's where there's more UI bugs. So props is the data that's pushed down from the top. And then state is whatever state is internal to the component itself. 
And then we have component will mount, which is for server-side rendering, and did mount for client-side. And then you can actually like really dig in and start optimizing these things. Um, there's a lifecycle method called should component update, where it gives you the current state and the next state, and then you can compare them and figure out like if you even want to re-render, which is a great uh, performance tool. But for me, it all comes down to getting a really, really clean render function. Um, and making them just as small as possible. So here I have a super simple component. Um, this is called an idea. It's basically um, an image. It could be image, text, ink, that's shared by anybody in the community associated with a person. And while that image is loading in, we show the squiggle. So like a render function could look like this. So it just has some kind of wrapper and then the squiggle, which is the placeholder image, and then the image. And we use images loaded. Um, to actually figure out what the current state of that component is. Um, so this is like pretty simple, but it could even be simpler. And that's the thing that we're constantly doing in our code base. We're trying to create the smallest render functions possible, so anybody actually looking at a React component can look at render right away and, um, and basically know exactly what's happening. And then the smaller we make our components, the easier it is for us to test them independently and specify the smallest contract possible for each one. And that goes for like absolutely everything in our code base. We're constantly creating tiny components, but even our assets, so we're using SVG for everything, and all of our SVG are actually React components. And what's really great with this is we can actually pass in the size, and using Viewbox and the, the height and width properties, we can actually resize all of our SVG just as components, and we get the advantage of click handlers, and whatever else that React offers from a component perspective. OK, so like, where does all this stuff break down? Like, The prop types is a pretty clear contract. We have render, which makes a lot of, um, which is our, our go-to for understanding any component. We have the component lifecycle. So it feels like we've encapsulated all of our components super well. But where it actually breaks down is with CSS, because that ends up being the only place now where there's potentially a source of bug um, when it comes to the actual appearance of a component. So what we've been doing a lot of recently is actually bringing our styles in line. I'm sure this is probably something you've heard of before. Um, and it's been really good for us because now our components are completely encapsulated. We don't have to switch hats every time we want to go do some styling of a component. Um, but React also has a bunch of great features. So there's a style property on every React component and it actually gives you warnings if you use an incorrect style name, and it automatically specifies PX on everything. So you actually get a lot of niceties, and there's a bunch of really great open source frameworks that are kind of shaking out of this whole inline styled movement. So expressiveness in the framework, it's in creating um, components that have a super clear contract, inline styles using custom prop types, and then getting the tiniest render function possible. But let's talk about tools, because that actually makes our experience of working with the framework that much better. And you know, it's like 2015, and our frameworks are getting smarter and smarter. They should be able to help us out already. So if I break a component contract, it should be able to tell me that. And if I break server-side rendering, it should be able to tell me that too. And if I busted the virtual DOM, which I'm relying on to get the performance I need on the front end, it should be able to tell me that as well. God, I love the wire. Um, so yeah, basically React developer tools. I'm sure a lot of us use Chrome DevTools. I'm kind of addicted um, to everything DevTools. But the fact that they, they're actually developing their own uh, developer tools is really, really helpful. Um, they actually just released um, a new drop last week, which does a whole bunch of great things, like you can actually update state and et cetera, like right in DevTools, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, it gives you warnings. You can actually inspect the, the React DOM tree, which is great. And uh, yeah, just the warnings in and of themselves are like indispensable. I don't know how we would have um, shipped our V1 without them. Uh, we actually had this really bad bug before launch where uh, the server was returning 1x images, and the client was returning 2x based on uh, the user agent. And so it was causing a, a total app re-render. But like, React warns you on that stuff right away. So what could have been potentially like a nasty bug to, to inspect like, ended up being really, really uh, solvable with their warnings, which is great. 
Um, next, Webpack. So Webpack is something we've been using. It's a, a module bundler, um, and it has support for CommonJS modules. We really like it for being able to require things like style files and um, JavaScript files, and I'm, this is just a CoffeeScript example. Um, but it's super easy to turn on source maps, and most importantly, what Webpack enables us to do is actually get React Hotloader, um, which allows you to tweak React components in, in real time. So it's kind of like a live reload uh, for jQuery, but it's, uh, it's pretty great. And like the real important thing that I want to emphasize here is like the better our tools are and the smarter they are and the more they help us, the less time we have to spend on all the minutia of, of, of just stressing out of, and trying to get something to work and the more time we get to spend um, actually creating new experiences. So moving into the server and beyond. Oh, that's a lot of stuff. So this is kind of, you can't see it, but the Kool-Aid man is behind this slide. Um, he's like kind of a little bit of red here, but this is what we're using um, at 53, a combination of all these things, including um, ES 2015's so using Babel. Um, and I find that like this stack has allowed us to really um, keep on the same uniform and like work in a super expressive way. So essentially like our app is an isomorphic universal app um, we know, don't have to like switch uniforms to go work on the back end and then go back to the front end, the back end and the front end. We, we, we wear the same uniform every time. And um, yeah, I'm Canadian, so I put a Mountie, or the Mounties. But um, to get server-side rendering with React, all you have to do is call render to string with the entry-level app component and then whatever props you want to populate it with, which is really great. And um, on top of that, like we're using Express.js, so um, you know, we have routes defined there, and then separately we're using, um, we were using backbone routers, so we had routes defined on the client. So basically we had this situation where we had like two traffic situations. It was like Express had its own idea of routes, um, backbone router had its own idea of routes, um, and we've recently been looking at switching over to, to React router, which actually gives us an isomorphic router that we can use across both. Um, so this is, again, just eliminating the, the sources of potential bugs in the app and really like uni unifying everything we do with like universal components. So routes kind of break down pretty simply, and then you can just use this both across the client and the server. So this is just a list of all the routes we have, and they're all nested, so you can go deeper than that as well. So at 53, our engineering team is actually half iOS and half web. Um, so when we first heard out about React Native, we kind of like freaked out because this feels like such a natural way for us to kind of bring the engineering team together. So React Native, it basically, it's like a learn the principles once and then develop elsewhere. So it's not like a build once, deploy everywhere. It's like learn the ideas once and then use them in different places. But I mean, as you can imagine with like some of our assets and stuff, there's, there's a lot of potential for finally being able to like have like a common set of things that we're using, which is really exciting. So like this is React Native, this is a tab bar component, and it looks just like the JavaScript components I was showing earlier. So we definitely looked to, to things like isomorphic React and React Native as a way of allowing us to keep using these ideas across everything that we're doing, using the expressive features of the language, using everything that the framework gives us that, that makes it easier to kind of onboard new people and, and express our components in a way that makes sense. So like, why do we even do this? There's a lot of stuff here. I know that this is like a pretty high level overview of, of kind of some, I don't know, ideas around how we're actually creating our apps at 53. But for me, um, when you're writing code in an expressive way and you're using the, like the, the cutting edge expressive language features, um, you're writing less code. So it's easier to read. It's also easier to code review. It's a lot easier to bring new people on. And just the universal nature of it, looking at the you know, uh, client, server-side rendering, React Native, 
Um, it just helps bring everything together. But the most important thing is that we get to spend time on our users and basically on creating really, really great user experiences. So going back to the beginning, to me, something is expressive when it does not need a long explanation. You just get it somehow, no matter how simple or complex. And then, um, yeah, so I work at 53, and I don't usually do product announcements or company announcements, but um, the timing was too crazy for this. My team is actually up right now because we're, we're launching a new product in about 30 minutes from now. Um, so I felt like maybe I could today. But yeah, we're basically releasing paper for the iPhone, so that's pretty exciting. Um, it's in the App Store now, and it should be in the press in about 30 minutes from now. So I thought I'd share that with everybody. Other than that, I'm really looking forward to getting to talk to everybody and hopefully talking about a lot of these ideas. I'd love to talk more about React and um, data and architecture, so come find me, and, and yeah, let's have those conversations. Thank you so much.